So I am uh, Casey's technology guru, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've spent my life in technology, surrounded by scientists, surrounded by business people, companies like Microsoft and Facebook. And it's, been, uh, it's been quite a ride. But one thing I've learned about science is there's all this wonderful hope, wonderful writers of tales like David Brin out here in our audience, one of the most accomplished sci-fi writers of our lifetime, are great at telling us the story of what can happen with science. But science is, uh, ultimately has to live in reality, just like we have to live in the reality of our world. Science has to live in the reality of our economy, too. How many people here remember when the human genome was sequenced, the year 2000, right? So we were all going to be cured of our genetic diseases. People went around on stage telling stories like, hey, look to your left, look to your right, because two out of the three people you now see are going to die of a genetic-rooted disease, cancer heart disease, diabetes, they all have their place in genes. Yet here we are, 12 years later, since they finished the human genome. Well, actually, it's quite a lie. They didn't finish sequencing the human genome in the year 2000. They actually finished it in 2003. So here we are nine years later. 2000 just made a really good time when everybody was down about the dot com to come out and say they'd claim victory. They were 87% done, pretty close. But how many people here have had their genome sequenced? How many people have received a genetic cure for a disease? <laughs> I think I hear a cricket. It's science and technology are two fundamentally different things. It took us 13 years and cost us $3 billion to sequence one human genome. Now at the end, I'm going to get back to what it actually takes today, but wasn't technology supposed to be fast? Well, it is. It's now less than $10,000 to sequence a genome. From $3 billion nine years ago to $10,000 today, sequence a genome. It took 13 years to sequence the first genome. Now it takes about 24 hours to sequence a human genome. That makes Moore's law look like a joke. Imagine ENIAC, built in 1948, and you had the iPod by about 1961. That's the rate at which biotechnology is accelerating. It's accelerating because of computer technology, but also because of globalization, because of distribution, because of the internet, the spread of knowledge. We're in a situation right now where technology is accelerating in its pace of change. That still doesn't mean these things are instant but it does mean things move faster when they actually hit the market. The science takes a long time, the marketing doesn't take much time. Take this guy, for instance. How many people here have a smartphone of some sort, Blackberry, Android, iPhone? Come on, raise your hands. There you go, let the lunch comas end. That was probably about 75% of the people in the room. And to be honest, because most of the people in this room here are above the age of 40, you're in the lagging demographic for iPhone distribution for smartphone distribution. 50% of all the phones sold now are smartphones. Yet this entire market was only existed about five years ago. Apple's iPhone alone has served 200 million devices. At 500 bucks a pop, you're talking about $100 billion worth of devices in five years. Name another single industry that grew from zero to $100 billion in five years. The iPad, tablets, 90 million tablets have been served since Apple released the iPad two and a half years ago. That's about 50% faster growth rate than the iPhone itself. So technology is supposed to move really fast, right? Well, think about the iPad for just a second. What is it, really? I mean, it's a flat screen television with a little touch screen on top of it, right? Flat screen television, is it sort of, you know, it's a father, it's grandfather. Well, flat screen television, the plasma display was the first flat screen television. I was asking folks at dinner last night to guess what year was the flat screen television invented? Give me. 92. I heard somebody from dinner who already knows. 1936, the patent that describes building a plasma television was filed. It wasn't until 1964 that Thompson actually built the first flat screen. And flat screens were around for a very long time before they started hitting commercial mass market viability. 
In the 1970s and 1980s, plasma displays were used in places where you needed industrial weight displays, very large weight things like these jumbotrons that you see up at the um, stadiums and things like that. Plasma display technology has been in production for at a commercial level since the mid-1970s, but it went mass market later. So the thing about technology is it follows this very strange growth curve. And I have to sort of apologize for the complexity of my graphs ahead of time. Uh, if you think Bud Conrad has very complex graphs, uh, I'm just going to just, all right. <laughs> Look, technology spends a really long time developing, a very long time in the early stage of its growth cycle. But what we are looking for as investors whose goal is to profit off of technology is technologies that have the potential to hit this sort of accelerating growth curve. It doesn't go on forever but it can mean a technology that goes from a million dollars a year to a billion dollars a year. It can mean a technology that goes from a million dollars a year to a hundred billion dollars a year, like the smartphone. It can be that kind of industry. But ultimately, what you're looking for is a technology that's had that time to bake, that's had that time to develop. Touch screen telephones, heck, there were guys at Bell Canada Research Labs in the mid-1980s developing interfaces for touch screen telephones. Most of those guys ended up at this little fruit company in California, but of, it took them years, it took them over a decade and a half to perfect the technology and even get it into a position where it could be trialed on a commercial basis. It took another five to seven years from there to make it commercially viable that you could go get one of these things for 99 bucks with a contract. That's that point you're looking for. Uh, Gartner, the research firm who studies technology, has a little curve of its own that it likes to show off and I think I'm a big fan of. And this is what they call the technology hype cycle. You know, technology comes out, there's some trigger point at the beginning when everybody starts talking about it. And next thing you know, it's going to solve every problem the world has ever known. You know, thank God for the paperclip. It's going to solve all the problems for storing things. Now, every kind of technology hits this hype cycle. You hit this, what they call this peak of inflated expectations. But there's another common thing that happens next. We all forget it happened. Like genetic medicine. When I talk to people about genetic medicine, they think it's now, you know, 100 years off. They think, well, yeah, it's a genome, it's gone, nothing's happening, there's been no progress. Nobody's talking to me about genetic medicine. Boy, this stuff is just such a, a pipe dream. And other things sold to me by sci-fi authors and, and popular mechanics in Wired magazine. Every technology goes through this pit where it hits this sort of, you know, this pit of despair. And then it begins to become practical. There's another graph, another very complicated one, that uh, you know, you've probably all seen before the normal distribution. Any product goes through, no matter what it is, technology, not technology, an adoption curve, any kind of new thing to market. At the beginning, only a few people pick it up. As it goes on, that, that, that size of that market gets bigger and bigger and bigger until about half the market's been chewed up. And then, of course, it begins to slow down. Once you've sold something to half the people in the world, you can only grow so fast. There's only so many people to buy something. It begins to slow down. Only thing is, there's this sort of famous hole in this graph. They call this process as getting from a technology that only geeks use to a technology that all of us use is crossing the chasm. There's a wonderful book by that name written about what it really takes to bring a technology to market. And what it really takes effectively is, is a confluence of multiple different circumstances. All the prerequisites, economic, scientific prerequisites, have to kind of align perfectly. We've all heard the story of technologies that were you know, too early for their own good. The science advanced far more than the economics. And you know, it was a great idea, but it was just 20 years too early. Like the plasma television, brilliant idea, but the manufacturing capability to operate at that level with those kind of substances is very, very, very advanced. It took computer technology, it took all the advances of Silicon Valley to take the idea of the plasma television and turn it not just into a reality, which happened in the 60s, but to turn it into economically feasible at a massive scale. So when all these things align, at the same time, it is always in that trough of disillusionment. It is always the technology no one is talking about anymore that is the one that's just about finally ready to break out and hit the mainstream. When just when the mobile phone really started to become sort of just a commodity that we all figured, yeah, yeah, they get smaller every day, they get cuter every day, little red Nokias and stuff like that, that boom, Nokia is over and Apple is the king. Google is the second place winner. You know, you've got uh, uh, high-tech computing from Taiwan, HTC, Samsung, all these companies that weren't even in the mobile phone business because the smartphone took off. Everybody talked about convergence. 
Everybody talked about how smartphones and, and, and you know, it was, convergence was the sort of watchword of it in the 1990s. Nobody talked about it until about two weeks before the iPhone was coming out again. When these things converge, very powerful economic things happen. Whole industries get created. But you have to hit a certain tipping point of adoption where it's just the economic reality of it is too hard to ignore. That is when you want to invest. So I'm going to tell you about four areas of technology where I see that happening today. All right, the iPod, right? 2001, iPod came out. Digital music was going to destroy the music industry. It was going to go away forever. There'd be no more album. We'd download all our music. Look, in 2002, when these articles were hitting the press waves, 1% of the music industry was digital. People were buying CDs, people were doing all this stuff. You know, even after we'd sold a few million iPods, people were not buying things. It wasn't actually until this year, it was the first year in history that 50% of all sales in the music industry will be digital downloads. But it's not just music. This isn't about you know, chasing some $8 billion US industry, some little pie. Right, $8 billion is little. Geez, I really am warped by these government statistics. Um, it's not about chasing a small industry. It's about the whole thing. Books. As of January 1st of this year, 33, 31% of all books, children, adult, fiction, nonfiction, were digital. This market didn't exist four years ago. It simply wasn't a market. It was a rounding error. It was like 0.001%. I can't even put it up on there. Yet, that was before people started using all the Kindles and Kindle Fires and iPads they bought that Christmas. As of the end of July, 50% of all book sales are now digital. Think about that. It took music how long to get there? It took books a third of the amount of time. It took music. Now movies. These little bar graphs at the bottom of this chart represent online movie views versus physical movie views, versus DVDs, Blu-rays, etc. In 2012, more movies will be consumed digitally than off of physical media. We will download 5 billion online movie views by the end of next year, according to IHS, the uh, television industry's uh, tracking system. And they have all the reason in the world to lie about that number, to flatten that growth curve. Because frankly, this is also the first time in history that cable subscriptions have ever decreased. The percentage of the population who subscribe to cable television has only ever increased since the day of its invention until this year. We're now in a position where half music, half of movies, half of books, television is even decreasing. People are getting their content digitally. Why do you think now when you log on to Amazon.com, the first five categories in their entire listing of product is digital? Then they draw a little black line and say, oh yeah, here's all the stuff we sell too. Here's where the shoes are. Amazon.com is reinventing its business around becoming the center of digital distribution. Apple is the king today, thanks to the iPhone, thanks to iTunes and the iPad, Apple sort of wins this business. But if you want a pure play investment of a company whose gross revenues are going to increase by a real amount based on digital sales, you have to look to the large caps. And the only thing even close to pure there is Amazon. Luckily, Amazon is a really well-run business. Their gross revenues are increasing because they're expanding globally. They're distributing all kinds of uh, goods around the world, growing their international franchises. More and more people are turning to buy stuff online. Uh, so they're growing that business at about you know, 7% annually. Their digital content business is growing at 30% annually. It's going to be Amazon's business within five years. It will be the overwhelming majority of their revenue. They'll be the, probably the biggest winner in the space. Companies like Netflix and stuff are growing too. They have financial problems you have to, to take consideration when you're investing. But digital content is something we've been talking about, been promised, the paperless office, the paperless home, for, what, two decades now. And all of a sudden, it's here. More than half of what we're doing with media is happening online. It's not just that either, though. Robotics. I mean, who remembers when automotive robots were going to take over the world, when those machines that like weld cars together were going to replace every human being in every factory in the world? But the first one of those robots was installed in the mid-1960s by General Motors in a plant in New Jersey. Still today, 
It's a $12 billion a year industry, but we still seem to need blue collar workers. We still seem to need people who build things, who make things. Sure, it's had an impact on some jobs, on welding, on, on ch handling chemicals, on lifting 3,000 pound displays, things that were dangerous and almost impossible for human beings to do. But industrial robotics didn't grow all that much. But there's another side to the robotics industry that very few people talk about that back in the year 2000 was just a $600 million a year industry, and they call it service robotics. It really started in medicine, where they adapted these kind of multi-arm robots. I can't really do that robot dance thing, but um, they adapted these multi-arm robots to start to do surgery, where they could do things that were really precise that human beings couldn't, but they were controlled by human beings. So the problem is this has been an industry with one arm tied behind its back. Well, or rather, it's been all arms, actually. The problem is robots couldn't see, they couldn't hear, they couldn't feel, they couldn't do anything like that. But all of our investment in military technologies over the past few years has helped advance sensors, things like night vision and infrared vision. They've been pumping millions and billions of dollars into these sensors, and the price has come down significantly. It's come down so much that even though nobody talks about it, this year, 2012, again, we're going to keep coming back to this theme, this year has been one of the most important years in scientific technology development, the development of real markets that's probably ever been. This year, for the first time ever, service robotics, robots that mow your lawn, that clean your gutters, that vacuum your carpets, is a larger industry than all industrial robotics around the world combined, a nearly 50-year-old industry. And service robotics is already larger, $13 billion a year. This is a new lawn mower from Honda. You want your Sunday back? Pop this thing on the back lawn, press a button, boom, lawn's mowed, right? Service robotics, but it's not really home. This is really a commercial business. Service robotics is about replacing human labor, especially expensive human labor. And I mean expensive not by white collar workers. I mean expensive by lawsuits. And one of the problems with us is we're really good at things like you know, spotting saber toothed tigers hiding in the grass and things like that. We're not really good about precision and mathematics and, and about getting things right. We're not good about efficiently finding paths from here to there. Robots are great at that kind of stuff. There's a company called Athon. It's a private company. You can't invest in it today. But they have a, a, a robot that drives around the hallways of hospitals, stopping off at rooms to dispense medicine. Think about that. You used to have armies of nurses paid $60,000 a year, walking around dispensing medicine. They make mistakes. Every mistake they make is millions of dollars in liability, potentially. Have a robot going around do it, it doesn't miss. Over 100 hospitals in the US already use Athon's robot. It's barely been out a year. Amazon.com, back to them. They recently bought a company called Kiva Systems. This is an interesting development in robotics. These little orange things at the bottom of the shelves, they're robots, like Roombas, like the lawnmower. They move around the warehouse. And they actually pick up the shelves and bring them to the human beings. If you look really carefully up in that uh, top of the picture, you see a guy bending over at a shelf there. You see that little black mat? That's the humans are allowed area. Apparently the robots are in charge. As you step out of there, you're gonna get run over by a shelf. But what's revolutionary about this technology? 90% reduction in humans needed to run a distribution warehouse. You stand a guy next to a truck and the shelves show up and say, take this box, throw it on the truck. That's it, the robots are in charge. They do the work. The service robotics industry is growing at an annual rate of about 25% per year. And that's sort of the magic number for moving up the line. What you'll find with every one of these spaces, digital music was growing at an average rate of about 27% a year. Digital books are growing at an average rate of about 35% a year. Small differences like that mean the difference between nine years and five years in getting to mainstream adoption. But all these industries are growing at these double-digit CAGRs. So even if the GDP is growing at 1% or, or negative 1%, as John indicated, these are businesses that are able to grow their gross revenues, their profitability, their margins, because they save capital or they provide new features or they move goods more efficiently. They're growing, and they're going to grow right through whatever kind of economy we go through, because they're selling globally, they're selling around the world. Service robotics, companies like Mako Medical, Intuitive Surgical, and I think most of all in the United States, iRobot, who gets the majority of its revenues from the military and heavy industry with uh, pack bots, these indestructible little driving tanks that they can send into nuclear wastelands or to dispose of bombs in Iraq. 
Those kind of companies are the next industrial revolution. They're moving us forward. They're moving forward the ability to move goods, to ship things. But of course, robots, they're not the things that are making goods, right? As we said, industrial robotics flattened a decade ago, hasn't grown. Our ability to make things is going to change just as much as our ability to move things, sort things, distribute things, do menial tasks. Robotics are a service industry. They're not a manufacturing industry. The future of manufacturing is a little machine like this. This is built by a company called Stratasys. Stratasys is a um, result of a merger between a large U.S. corporation and a uh, large Israeli corporation that were both leaders in a technology called additive manufacturing, or what most people have heard of it called is 3D printing. And the 3D printing analogy, it comes from a very old version of this kind of technology where people took literally the heads off of inkjet printers, these little cheap print heads, and instead of having them shoot out ink, they shot out plastic. And it ran over the same spot over and over and over again building up little layers of plastic, and they can build little you know, toys and, and models and things like that. Well, this is actually an industry that's been around, I think most people don't realize, since the early 1980s. Additive manufacturing has been growing at a 27% rate since that period of time, and it's hit that hockey stick. It's at the beginning of that growth curve, where now the companies in this space are selling tens of thousands of systems a year. The price of a machine has dropped from about $800,000 to $80,000 in the industrial space. There are 3D printers that cost as little as $2,000 now for doing things like prototyping. It's just like the PC industry was. In fact, it's so much like the PC industry that it's driven by hobbyists. The 3D printing industry, what's really fascinating about it is there are these maker clubs out there Maker Fair and Maker Bot and all these kind of clubs where guys like this, guys who were Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, members of the Berkeley Computer Club at the same time, before the PC took off, the geeks were off toiling around with this stuff, bringing down the cost of this stuff, experimenting. In 2007, five years ago, there were less than 100 personal 3D printers even built. You pretty much know where all of them are, thanks to the fact that everybody shared them on the internet. Everybody, I built a 3D printer. I built it. These personal level printers defined as you know, costing less than $1,000 uh, to build. Now there are greater than 50,000 of these things. And by the end of next year, there will probably be somewhere on the order of about a quarter million of these machines out there. Cheap machines. In fact, they make one called the RepRap um, that can actually build 90% of the parts required to build itself. So thank you, my robot la masters. I hereby secede. You guys are in charge. Uh, now that they can replicate, they can walk, they'll give me my little black mat, I'll stand there and load trucks. No, in all seriousness, additive manufacturing is, is revolutionary for a whole bunch of really interesting reasons. Number one is, in the early 1980s, the only thing you could do was thermoplastics. They weren't useful for anything. They were brittle. They fell apart. They were these kind of silly little things. Now, with additive manufacturing, you can do all kinds of different metals, aluminums and steels and stuff. There are techniques like selective laser sintering. Selective laser, selective laser sintering is actually what built this little guy here. This is an electron microscope looking at an item that was carved to a precision of 10 nanometers, or about a third of the size of the transistor on the average Intel chip. I mean, we're talking molecular scale. This technology is still in the lab, but it's based on the same technology that 3D Systems in the United States, the second largest 3D printing company in the world, that they have out there for producing metallic objects. This thing is precise to the atom, yet can produce a meter of material a second. So think about that. Think about how imprecise manufacturing is today, retooling, testing, molds, all this stuff with good software, with techniques like selective laser sintering, with the traditional thermoplastic extrusion, with some of the other really advanced 3D printing technologies out there, we're now in a position where we can manufacture things without waste. We can manufacture them when we need them because we don't have all the tooling changes, all the complications. One machine can make two entirely separate, different shapes of parts, one right after the other, with no context switching cost. Nothing. 
So instead of having a factory that makes widgets and a factory that makes wadgets, just have a machine that prints four widgets, five wadgets, four widgets, nine wadgets, depending on who orders what. It's revolutionary because it gets rid of inventory. It moves production to a more local environment. Instead of labor is no longer what makes production important. Skill is what makes production. The intellectual value of an invention is where all of the value is created with additive manufacturing. But it doesn't just end there. It doesn't just flip the economics of manufacturing on its head and make it so that shipping material over to China only to put it together and ship it back here is cheaper. It allows us to make things we could never make before. You can make shapes. You can create these tessellations. You can print out things. I've seen people print out, using plastic, a full-size mattress that weighs maybe about 20 pounds and yet is as firm and secure as one of those thermo, you know, these uh, what are memory foam mattresses, right? So you're talking about something that weighs like, like a, a little bit. And why that's important, we can create all those lightweight materials we've been reading about in popular science and in wired and popular mechanics for 30 and 40 years. These materials that are gonna allow us to have cars that go 200 miles per gallon. Look, you, your car can't get 200 miles per gallon unless it weighs 200 pounds. It's just, it, it violates the law of physics. But if you can make a car that's as strong as a current car, that gets hit by a Hummer and does just fine, but really only weighs 200 pounds, you're gonna have 200 mile per hour cars. And that's what's interesting. Additive manufacturing allows you to create shapes in infinite amounts of detail and in infinite amounts of construction patterns, anything you can come up with, because you build it from the ground up. You're not trying to drill holes in something and you can't reach the middle of it, create that shape. It's going to lead to a generation of people that look like this guy, that reinvent every object that we have in our hands, because every object we have in our hands is built with the idea of subtractive manufacturing. So the same way that the PC has led people to rethink every aspect of communication, the reason that the, the PC era was the precursor to things like the smartphone and the internet and all these incredible inventions, that have changed our lives. Additive manufacturing has the ability to do that, to do what the PC did for information and knowledge work. Additive manufacturing will do for things. Drugs. How big an industry? I mean, I've been talking about $10 billion industries, $100 billion industries, forgetting medicine as a whole. How big an industry do you think drugs are every year today? Throw me a number. 100 billion, is it higher? 250 billion, is it higher? 500 billion? It's higher. Today, drugs account for $750 billion of a $15 trillion global economy. There is no other single sector let alone a subsector that is as big as drugs. It's a huge industry. Yet this year, $75 billion per year worth of traditional pharmaceuticals will lapse out of patent protection. And there is basically nothing to replace them. Drugs like Lipitor, that at its peak generated $11.5 billion a year in sales from a little pill. Drugs like Viagra, all kinds of traditional, what they call small molecule drugs, things that are built of the science of chemicals, things that came out of companies from New Jersey like Merck and Pfizer who grew up as chemical companies and came of age as drug companies. And that's because we've sort of hit the limit. Now there's gonna be small molecule drugs, but we've sort of, in a way, hit the limit of what small molecules can do. We are not made of small molecules. We are made of big, hairy, weird, strange, odd things called proteins and lipids, and, and they're complex, and they interwork with each other in ways that we can only begin to fathom and understand. 2003, we got a pretty good look at how our inner workings of our genetics happened. We had sequenced the human genome. We had no idea what it did, but we sure counted from one to 80 billion genes. We knew where they all are. Now we're starting to begin, now we're beginning to understand how genetics work. We're beginning to take some of what was theory 
years ago and turn it into practice. I told you 2012 is a really big year. That $10,000 number of sequence of genome by the end of this year will actually be less than $1,000 on average for every human genome that has been sequenced over the course of 2012. Less than $1,000. The implications of this? In the early 1980s, scientists were talking about something called monoclonal antibodies. It got a lot of press back then. It was a big deal. It was going to be the beginning of the biologics revolution. It was right about the same time that the first couple biological drugs came to market. 1980s. Early development of this stuff was relatively slow, though. Monoclonal antibodies have been used for a few treatments here and there, but they've never really been huge. This year, the FDA approved for the very first time something called an antibody drug conjugate. They actually can find antibodies within your body that react to, say, cancer cells, and they found these, and they can take those antibodies and they can basically duct tape onto the back of them a big old piece of chemotherapy, or in fact, actually a little old piece of chemotherapy, because chemotherapy is traditional chemical small molecule stuff. They can actually put it on the back of this antibody, send the chemotherapy into your system, and for these non-solid state tumors, for these, these kind of diseases like basal cell carcinoma and things like that where you have lots of lesions or you can't identify all the cancer, instead of chemotherapy that destroys your entire body, the chemotherapy only becomes active when it hits a cancer cell. Imagine that. Changes the way we treat cancer forever. 2012, very first one of these. They've been worked on for over 15 years on their own. Monoclonal antibodies have been 30 years in development. This year was the year the very first one was approved from a company called Seattle Genetics. Seattle Genetics has a massive evaluation based on all the hype behind this technology. I don't know that you want to race out and buy it today, but it's a fantastically run company with incredible technology. But it's not like that's the only thing that's happened in biotech this year. Biotech has also seen the very first of a really incredible breakthrough technology that is right in the middle of the trough of uh, disillusionment. A couple of years ago, everybody heard about a technology called RNAi. I brought it up at dinner last night. A young biotechnology scientist was at the table with us, and, and she sort of rolled her eyes at me a little bit about RNAi, because it's one of those things that was going to change the world, it was going to save everything. A paper written in 1997 defined what RNA was, the temporary on-off switch for your genes. People who have heard me talk before have heard me talking about this for two, three years now. But in 2006, this won the Nobel Prize. But from 1997 to today, today, the very first, just three months ago, very first RNAi treatment, very first temporary genetic medicine, a pill you can take, a shot you can have that will turn off a gene that does something that 50 million years ago was evolutionary advantage to an ape but ain't helping us today. We can now turn those genes off. And that includes the genes in cancer that make it unique. That includes genes behind things like Huntington's disease. Kynamaro from a company called Isis Pharmaceuticals has been one of the most expensive drugs to ever get to market. I've been reminded that Isis went public in 1983. They finally have their first commercial product. This stuff takes a long time, but when it comes to market, it floods up. The demand for these kind of medicines are here. There are companies following Isis, like Alnylam Pharmaceuticals, ALNY. These guys are founded by the guy who wrote the paper and won the Nobel Prize for RNA on medicine. They use Isis's platform. They've got dozens of antisense drugs, dozens of these RNA drugs in development, but the first one was this year. This year will probably also mark another advance in cancer fighting. Celsion is a company that has actually taken something called liposomes, another 1980s biotechnology that's been in the lab and used heavily by researchers for many years, but has never really seen a huge amount of clinical use in a way that would change the way we do medicine. What Celsion does is they wrap chemotherapy inside of one of these liposomes, a little piece of fat, and they inject it into your system wrapped in the fat, and it's inert. It doesn't interact with your body. It doesn't do damage. When you have solid tumors, the opposite of the kind of tumors Seattle Genetics is targeting right now with their antibodies, you then point a radio wave at the tumor. The chemo's there, waiting. Radio wave bursts open the liposomes, and chemo works only locally. It turns chemo, which is far more effective to radia than radiation, into something that's as precise as radiation treatment. It changes the basic economics of the way we fight cancer today. In December of this year, the FDA is due to make a decision on whether or not that technology is allowed to market. 
And I'm a little bit over time, so I'm going to give you one last one. The thing about biotechnology, the thing about genetic medicine, all these promises, is they, they take many, many years to come to fruition, but they accelerate. There's something, a, a branch of cancer-fighting science called pathway inhibitors. The idea is that cancer grows unabated. That's what makes it so hard to fight. When, when your doctor is sleeping, when your doctor is working with another patient, when your doctor is out to dinner, your cancer is spreading. That makes it a very difficult thing to fight. But if you can turn off that ability for cancer to grow, you get a huge advantage in fighting it. You buy yourself something that any cancer victim would love to have, and that's time. Pathway inhibitors promise, or I should say promised, to make that possible. Because the first one from a little company called Curis was approved again this year in 2012. More novel techniques for biotechnology therapies have been approved in 2012 than in the five years preceding it. This has been a huge year for the advancement of biotech from science to adoptable mass market technology. Curis doesn't just have one of these pathway inhibitors. They're targeting basal cell carcinoma with this one. It's a very difficult, almost impossible to treat cancer today. It means that they have a market relatively to themselves. There's not a lot of competition. They're helping patients who have never been able to be helped before. But they actually have 26 more pathway inhibitors targeted at different forms of cancer in their pipeline. 2012 has been one of the single most exciting years to be in technology, period. But remember that technology is different than science. So when you hear about something, when you think about something, when you look at one of these dreams, one of these sci-fi books, and Wired is just as sci-fi as pretty much any other piece of fiction written out there, understand, where's the market? Has the technology progressed far enough that we can actually see mass market adoption? Are the economics there? Can this technology do what they say, cross the chasm? Can it make it from something that happens in the lab to something that affects all of our lives? These are four industries that are going to change our economy forever. In every one of these industries, America is the leader, by far. These are the technologies that are going to bring us through what we're going through today and that are going to power our economy and are going to grow shareholder wealth for the next decade. Thank you.